See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire of him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Amy, thank you so much for that reading. Well, good evening. If you're new visiting, my name is Jis Hesh. I'm one of the ministers on staff here at Holy Trinity. Great joy to be sharing uh, with you from that passage. Uh, if you've got Bibles open at home or on your Bones do keep them open at that wonderful passage. And many of you will know that that passage really speaks about the heart of Easter. Jesus' death on the cross and and his resurrection. The prophet Isaiah seeing these things over 600 years in advance, glimpsing them, being comforted and challenged and provoked by them. And many of us, as we just heard Amy beautifully read that out, will have just seen how it just so points to what Jesus did at the cross, all those individual, intricate prophecies that were fulfilled on that day, that day of days. But interestingly, this passage has often not been taken as that. In fact, this passage has been rejected time and time again as pointing towards Jesus, because it's just too shocking, because it's just too outlandish to actually be about someone who would save the world. Uh, I came across uh, recently the... Um, news that in Jewish synagogues that they have uh, often found themselves having to remove this very passage, Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, from the yearly readings that they have from the, uh, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And it's fascinating that actually it just causes such shock when people read this. That is this what the Messiah is going to be like? This can't be right. This can't be true. And to help you understand why this this passage is so shocking, I want you to uh, engage with a little bit of a thought experiment that I'm inviting you into. I want you to imagine that you are really rich. You're you're stinking rich. Um, And you're also really powerful. And you can just click your fingers and make things happen. You have that kind of power over people. And you gather together all the greatest scientists and economists and political and and philosophical leaders of the generation, you gather them together and you charge them with one question and you say to them, look guys, I've got a goal and it's one goal. I want to be known forever. I want to be the most influential and famous person in all of history I want to be glorified and worshipped by millions. I want whole civilizations to be built on my teachings. And I want one defining act that people are going to remember forever to lead to that. What should I do? What should I do? Well, if these guys took you seriously, perhaps they would, because you've got that kind of money and power. What do you think that they would say in response to that challenge? I wonder if any of them would say the following. 
Well, we think you should be born in obscurity, that you should avoid ever getting involved in anything political or economic or academic. Live a life that would be despised by most and the life that ultimately leads to an event of great suffering and shame that would actually put you on par with the very dregs of society, the least, the scum of the earth. And if you do those things, well, then your eternal glory is going to be established and you're going to get everything that you wish and want. Can you imagine what the reaction would be? Uh, the shock, if someone said that, was the answer. Well, that's the kind of shock that this passage has for us. That actually, that's the shock behind what Isaiah predicts Jesus would do. That actually God's means of establishing Jesus' eternal glory would be through something so unexpected, so hideous, so shameful, that it defies human expectation, that it would be through the events of the cross. That that would be the way that Jesus is glorified. It's really interesting that Isaiah starts the passage by saying about these events that this servant who fulfills these words will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. That as he does these things, that he's going to be lifted to the highest place, that this is going to be a time of his glory. In fact, when the Apostle John in the New Testament quotes these words of Isaiah, he says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory in advance. He saw Jesus being glorified in these words, lifted high. Just like uh, we might call the Queen or Prince Charles, her or his royal highness, just talking about their glory and their prestige, their high and lifted up position. Isaiah says that what these events are is how Jesus is going to be lifted really high and exalted and glorified. These events that describe such sh suffering, such shame, and we often miss just how awful the cross would have been. We often miss the shame that it would have carried. Uh, we've made it familiar. We've made it an easy message. We've made it something that we just put around our necks and on our walls and on our mantelpieces. But actually the, sh the cross in those days, in the days that Jesus lived and died on one, would have been of utter shame and horror. It's really interesting that we know that uh, the crucifixion that Jesus went through, many in his time did go through, was reserved just for the utter dregs of society. For those who were the poorest, uh, slaves who were in bondage, and also for the worst of criminals. And Jesus shared in that kind of shame. We know that actually it was deliberately designed to dehumanise people through the process that led up to the cross, so that those that ended up being crucified were no longer considered part of the human race, that actually they're just to be treated like animals on a stick. We know that in polite society of the time, in the Roman Empire, you just would never speak about crosses and crucifixion because it was so shameful. It, it was a, worse than a taboo subject because it was so horrible. And we know it's so horrible, actually, that the Roman Empire itself, a few centuries after Christ's death on a cross, outlawed it as a means of execution, even for them who'd learned how to perfect it as a means of torture. They said it was too much, it was too horrible, we can't do this anymore. And so when Isaiah says that that's what Jesus' glory is going to look like, that Jesus is going to be glorified through these events, the question, of course, is how is that possible? This awful thing, how is it possible? And Isaiah gives us a hint as to how that is. And it is that in those events of great shame, of great suffering, that actually they weren't to Jesus' personal shame. They were to his glory. And it's because unlike every single other person who was crucified, he had a choice about it and he could have avoided it. And yet he didn't. And he didn't because of us. He didn't because of his love for us. He didn't because he wanted to save us. He didn't because he wanted to make a way that we would be his. And the more that we see this, we, the more that we see what Jesus went through for us, the greater we just see his glory, how glorious he is, that he did that for us, that he did it for you and me. It's really interesting that Isaiah seems to indicate that Jesus at the cross would suffer in every single way possible. And we know that he did. He says that actually Jesus would choose 
to take up physical pain, that he would be pierced, that he'd be wounded, that he'd be crushed. And we know that he died out of, out of the crushing weight of his own body, coming down and caving in upon himself, that he died because he was pierced and the blood lost, that he died because he was wounded, that he suffered great physical suffering. And on top of that, Isaiah says that he's going to suffer a great mental suffering, that he's the one who's despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrows, familiar with pain. And we know again that's exactly what happened. He was rejected by every single person he held closest to him. Every single one of his disciples ran away at the, at the cross. One even betrayed him into the authorities' hands, and another one, the one he thought was his closest friend, said, I want nothing to do with him. I don't know him, when he was questioned about it. And the same crowds that on Palm Sunday, as Cam read out at the beginning of the service, shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are the same crowds within a few days who shout out, crucify him, crucify him. Utterly left alone, rejected, in great mental anguish as well. And on top of that, Isaiah predicts the great suffering that came ultimately because of our sin. He went through all those things to enter into sin itself, the worst of humanity. And he himself, who knew no sin, became sin. And he became sin and died as our representative, our substitute. It says that he's pierced for our transgressions so that by his wounds we are healed. That that intimate, perfect, loving union that he knew with the Father from all eternity, well, that was rent in two and torn asunder. And instead, what he got was the fierce anger and wrath of God instead, the forsakenness of the one he loved the most with a perfect love, because he became sin on our behalf. We just can't imagine the suffering that Jesus went through in the cross. It defies explanation. And his glory is revealed in this because he chose it for us. He chose it for me. He chose it for you, whether you've known this yourself personally or you've never known this. He saw you in advance and said, you are worth this. You're worth this suffering, and I'm dying for you. We know that Jesus, should he have wanted to, could have complained, could have defended himself on the way to the cross and gotten out of it. Isaiah in the passage says twice that, however, he did not open his mouth. He just kept silent. He just said, I've got to do this. We know that had he opened his mouth, he could have just commanded 12,000 angels in an instant, and they would have rescued him off the cross. We know that when he was crucified, when other people opened their mouths and said, save yourself, if you're such a great saviour, save yourself in derision, the religious leaders and the thief on the cross, he could have. He didn't even need to click his fingers and he would have come off the cross and be transformed into radiant glory and kept in that perfect place where no one would be able to ever touch him again. And he would have silenced every tongue, but he didn't. And the reason he did it, he didn't do those things, was for us. It's interesting, Isaiah keeps saying again and again in this passage that he took up our pain, bore our suffer, sorrow, that it was for us. He brought us peace, that we all have gone like sheep astray, and each of us, that actually when we see these things, when we hear these things, when we realize these things, we we to say, this is for us. He did it for us. We put ourselves in the events of the cross and say, that is your glory, Jesus, that you show such perfect love. That is your glory, that you'd save us like that. What a wonderful saviour you are. And it might be that you're here and you've just never realised that Jesus did those things for you personally. There's an old church father, St. Augustine, that said that even if you were the only person on the face of the planet, Jesus would still have done these things for you, personally, because he loves you that much. And if, if you've never known those things, invite him in. This Jesus, who did these things for you in advance, before you were even born, he did them because he loves you, and he wants that loving relationship with you forever, and he's made a way for it. But for many of us, we've done that. 
We've done that. And the question is, well, seeing what Jesus did at the cross, seeing this great suffering, suffering, what's our response to be to these things? And interestingly, the Bible makes it really clear that our response to seeing Jesus' glory and his suffering at the cross is to see it, be amazed by it, of course, worship him because of it, but then to do likewise and follow him in the same path. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2 says this, If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He says that whenever you choose God's way, whenever you choose the right way, and suffer as a consequence. Well, what you're doing is that you're sharing in what Jesus did at the cross, that amazing and glorious work where you get to participate in it, you get to share in it because you choose his way. That actually Jesus gave that ultimate example for us to follow and his very footprints for us to walk in. Some of you will know that the old Christmas cow, Good King Wenceslas, tells the story of a king going into the countryside in the middle of a snowy winter's evening and seeing a poor villager trying to gather together firewood and feeling great compassion for this villager, wondering how he's going to eat that night. And so he returns home and tells his page to go to that villager with a, an abundance of rich food to feed their family. And the page turns to the king and says, I can't do that. I don't know the countryside as well as you do. I'll get lost in the snow. Please don't send me. And the king says in that Christmas carol, I'll go ahead of you and create a path by my footprints. And you just follow in them. In the words of the carol, he says, Mark my footsteps, gird my page. Tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage freeze thy blood less coldly. That the king gives him a path to tread in so that the page can just have courage to step into that winter's night and get to where he needs to go. And I want to say to you that the king of kings, Jesus himself, has gone ahead of us. And he's given us the path with his very own footprint so that when he calls us, to a moment of great suffering, when he calls us, calls us to choose between his way, the difficult way, and the world's way, and the easy way, that we might see what Jesus did and have courage to step out into it and to follow him likewise. As a leadership team, we've just had a sense in the prophetic that especially over the last season of lockdown, this has been going on in the secret place. That for some that you've been just faithfully serving and seeking God in some really tough circumstances and it's involved suffering as a result, even though you could have chosen an easier way and not experienced the things that you did, but you have chosen God's way and it's hurt and it's painful. And what I want to say to you that this is Jesus' way and that God sees that you've just chosen the same path that his son went in. And when he sees that, he's delighted and he honours you and say, says, just as you shared in Jesus' suffering, just as you shared in that same path of great suffering, so you share in his glory. And let me show you what that's going to look like in the season to come. And I just think for all of us, the call is to respond to Jesus' cross with our own personal crosses, that when push comes to shove and we have to decide by, between that really difficult path that sacrificial path of choosing God's way or the easy path, the path perhaps that we've always trodden down, the path that everyone else treads down, that we're to look to the cross this Easter and just see Jesus' footprints going before us to Calvary and say, I see them and I'm following them. We look to the ground and we just choose to take that first step and put our feet into them and then the next step and the next step after that, choosing his way. There's of great suffering, perhaps, but of even greater glory. And the Lord honours you in that. Let me just pray for us as we end. Lord, we just thank you for the cross, Lord. We're just amazed. 
We're so amazed by what you've done for us. We, we just see your glory in that, that you love so perfectly and abundantly, that you'd love even someone like me. And Lord, we pray and ask that we might honour you rightly with our lives as a result. We pray and ask that we choose the difficult path, the path that you chose for us, that we would choose as well. We pray that your example of going before us and having such great shame and suffering might give us the confidence to follow you into it as well. And we thank you that as we do that, you see it. And that as we do that, we share in your glory. So come, Lord Jesus, and help us to walk that out in our lives day by day, we pray. Amen.